if I if I if I understand this correctly, after you win like 133 Emmys, yeah. you 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 <laughs> you win you win like a million yeah, Emmys. Yeah, I buy screenwriting for dummies and, and you I go, start reading. You, you buy the screenwriting Mad Libs and start filling it yeah. in. That's exactly it. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody. It's all a fluke. Dan, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm so honored to be here. Oh. I'm such a fan of this. I'm such a fan of this show. So it feels very, it feels great to be here. I wish you were actually here. Here, I tell you that much. I wish I was actually here. It's all. I mean, I would have gotten on a plane had the premiere of the movie not been tonight. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, we we had to stay behind, but I'm there and physically there in spirit. Um, congratulations on the film. It's 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 really beautiful. Thank you very much. I wonder. Thanks. I wonder if you would tell me a little bit about, uh, if you don't mind, about a little bit about what inspired it. My my understanding is, sort of the or, original sort of brainchild for for a film that explores grief came from the passing of your grandmother. Is that right? Yeah, and then and then my dog, funnily enough, and um, you know, I think grief. grief is, I, I've been, I haven't experienced a lot of it in in my life, and so the feelings were kind of new and confusing and. It was coinciding with the tail end of, of the pandemic, and I feel like we were all experiencing a kind of collective grief that we've never known before. And trying to detangle it and trying to understand what it meant in relation to like a personal loss had me very confused and had me feeling like in some way I was betraying uh, my grandmother by not feeling as much as I physically thought I should. And it was a hard thing. And it was in that process that I, I thought, well, maybe there's a story to be told here in terms of um, trying to understand what grief means and trying to find meaning and trying to find an answer. Um, and I knew that I wanted to, to make a story about friendship. I knew that I wanted my next project to be focused on friendship. Um, and then it was just about figuring out, well, how does grief and friendship coincide and what does it all mean? And in the case of the film, it just ended up being, you know, an, an exploration of friendship in the wake of a great loss. And my character trying to understand what it, whether he's doing it properly, <laughs> ultimately. It's, it was a confusing, it's a, I think grief can be an incredibly confusing thing. Um, and through the process of writing the movie, I, I feel like I was able to, tr to, to, tr to find some kind of answer. I don't even know if there is one, but I, felt, I found closure, I guess. Let me, let me make sure I understand, I, I understand you correctly, because you said a lot there that I, I, I think is really beautiful and, and I want to I wanna touch on. So, mm -hmm. you're, so we're going through that pandemic as a, uh, in the sense of like just unimaginable kind of collective grief happening mm -hmm. all the time. And and in that time, your your grandmother passes away. Uh, do, do you mind if I ask what her name was? Her name was pa Patricia. Patricia. Pat. 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 To, to those who loved her. And this is your paternal or your, your maternal grandmother. This is my maternal grandmother. Yeah. So so she she passes on, and you start feeling um, actual grief. And I, I've experienced that sort of grief in my life, where we're sort of sold one thing in, in TV and movies about the way grief feels. It's unimaginable, and we dress all in black, and we, and we keen, and we lie in the basement, and we cry, and we're not allowed to feel any other emotions. And because you weren't feeling that, because that wasn't your experience fully, you began to wonder, am I feeling, am I feeling grief correctly? Correct. Am I honoring her appropriately? Um, she was one of the most meaningful people in my life. So um, the confusion about why my f physical body wasn't feeling what my m mind wanted it to was a strange conversation. And funnily enough, I was in Toronto at the time, and I remember, and this might be, a, I, I, I'm trying to kind of articulate it in a way that makes sense. But I remember walking down the street, this was months after, it was December, and it was snowing. And the snow was falling like very, it was big flakes and it was falling really slowly and there was such a beauty to the, what was happening around me. And I remember thinking, oh, like, the world is not thinking about what I'm thinking. The world is moving on. 
and the world will move on regardless of my feelings in it. And it kind of exploded this, it, 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 it reminded me of like I, how small I was and yet also exacerbated like it, it blew open all of these feelings. And I remember walking my dog when he was still alive in the snow and having a cry by myself, like walking down the street months after my grandmother had passed. And I had obviously physically cried when, when she had passed, but the, the, the ache, the cinematic kind of loss wasn't, wasn't coming to me at the time. And it, it took this very strange moment yeah. in the snow yeah. to crack open a, a, a kind of openness or like sensitivity to, to life, I guess, <laughs> that I realized I, I wasn't feeling. I think we were so hardened by the pandemic. We yeah. were so existing in this kind of like, we had fortified ourselves physically. There were masks on us. We were in hazmat suits. We were spraying down, you know, I mean, and, and I, I was able to, to feel again in this moment. Yeah. And it was then that I realized I think there's a story to be told. I think I think I have to I think I think my path through this is to is to write it down. I wrote down that moment uh, in a notes app as soon as I got home from that walk and it, it's just this run, run run on sentence that makes no sense about snow <laughs> and my <laughs> emotionality <laughs> and my dog and life <laughs> and death. Um, and I remember like when I started to write the screenplay, like looking at that notes app and thinking, I don't know really what any of this means, and yet I feel it. <laughs> oh, okay. You couldn't. You couldn't. You weren't entirely sure what you were getting. You weren't entirely no. sure what you had written, but you knew what you were getting at. Yeah, I was in a very emotional state of just like <laughs> stream of consciousness, and yet, you know, it, while it didn't make logistical sense, it certainly conjured a, a feeling that I wanted to capture on on screen in a in a story. Your your character Mark's um, husband uh, dies, and uh, pretty pretty early on in in the film. So I think we that we can call that not a spoiler. Yeah. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think I I thought because I didn't know anything about the film before I watched it. I tried to go in blind, and great. I thought that the movie was going to be about your character finding I thought we would be introduced to a new love interest and the rest of the movie would be about how to find love again after unimaginable loss mm -hmm. in the beginning parts of our conversation you said you wanted to write a, a film ab about friendship I don't know if I've ever seen a film about friendship like this why mm -hmm. why were you thinking about friendship in writing a story about grief because as a single man in the world my friends outside of my family are my support system and they were there for me when i ha was had finished that stream of consciousness snow episode they are there for me in in all all through my life they've been there for they've been there for me when i came out of the closet they they play such a formative role in in who i am as a person in how i've gained confidence as a person in how i feel supported as a person and I wanted, and, and I think I'm 40 now, but going through my 30s, that entire decade, I think, was the most revolutionary, like, decade of my life when it came to friendships. And how sometimes, like, the bigger our lives get, the bigger our friendships get, the more complicated they get, the messier they get, the more you have to speak truth with your friends, the more, the harder the conversations get, because the stakes are higher. And coming out of my 30s, I was looking back and thinking, I need to capture this. I need to capture these moments of, of mess, of joy, of support, of love. Um, because as someone who doesn't have a partner, I don't get to see that love story at all. I've played a friend on the sidelines in movies before. I know that the friends historically operate as, yes, a support system, but as a support system in the propulsion of a love story. Yeah, kind of like, a kind of a B, they're kind of there to give expository dialogue about the love story. You guys seem yeah, to really like, like each other, you know, that kind of thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. a fun little, and a fun little joke here and there, and, <laughs> yeah, and they can sure, be done sure. really well. I mean, yeah. you know, I look at Notting Hill and I think that's a, that movie did friendship really well yeah. in terms of a support cast. But I hadn't seen in a very long time, and I'm, I fail to, to, to find a movie right now on the spot that I can think of that centers friendship, but 
It felt really important. It felt important to tell a love story about friendship, one that inverts our idea of how things should be, which is let the romance live on the outside and let the friendship take center stage for once. And I, I owed it to my friends. I owed it to the, every friend in my life that has helped me get here because it's, it's a precarious road. And particularly now more than ever, I think with, with a kind of success that I didn't ever see coming, my life has taken all of these different t twists and turns and it's my friends that are the constant. I don't have a lot of like famous friends. Most of my friends are, are the same as, as before you know, all of this happened. And it's important because they're the people that remind you of who you are. And they're the people who force you to kind of, you know, put your ego aside and, and, and you know, remember who you were before things got like a little fancier. Gr ground you, they, they say, to ground you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This film and this role is, I'm going to be careful about this. It's sort of an inversion of what most of us know you for. There's um, the easy way to think about that is that Schitt's Creek is a comedy and this is a, a drama. I think it's more a little more complicated than that. And the way I've been thinking about it is that Schitt's Creek is a comedy with heart and drama in it. This is a, a, a more dramatic story still with elements of, of comedy in it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it, it kind of, I think it acts as almost a bookend to Schitt's Creek in a way. It's like the polar opposite in every way. It's, it is exactly as you said. It is a drama that has elements of comedy as opposed to a comedy that has elements of, of sentimentality. Um, and yet, we'd always seen Schitt's Creek as a drama. I mean, as a writer's room, it was always, it was one of the kind of the major f ideas that we took into every season, which is to remind ourselves that inherently, this is a drama. It's the circumstance. It's the characters and the circumstance coming together that makes the comedy. But at the at the root of of the story, it's it's inher it's inherently dramatic. They've lost everything. They have to start again. The fact that they're deeply incapable people is the humor. But so for me, in my mind, to to go from that to this project is not as great a a leap as I think a lot of people might think because I always approached Schitt's Creek through the lens of a drama. And then how do we how do we contort it and twist it? And and play with it to bring the comedy out. This was sort of sort of the opposite. A any nerves about changing a little bit though? Like, is there any, any nerves about trying something new, whether it be a film or a film with a different tone? There was nerves about earning people's trust, and there was nerves about asking. You know, you ask when you make a movie, you ask. You're asking a lot of people. You're asking a lot a lot of people's time and energy, you're asking a lot of your actors. And I think for me doing something completely different, and, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a very self-critical person, so I often have to overcompensate. I have to, I have to kind of repress my own self-doubt in order to feel like I can do something. And in this particular case, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of overriding my natural impulses to say like, you're out of your league, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, how do you do that? Because I think deep down I know that I'm capable of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I think so many of us kn know that we are capable of things that our brain kind of stops us from feeling like we can actually do. Yeah. And it it is, you, you get an opportunity to make a movie. I'm not going to let the ego side of things ruin that experience for me. At least I, I'm trying desperately not, not to. And I was lucky enough, I think, through the process of making the movie, you know, you you get a phone call that Ruth Nega wants to meet. And I think, okay, I'm going to repress the, the question of why. Yeah. And I'm going to instead try to see this as a compliment. You know, this is an Academy Award nominated, unbelievable actress who has read a script that I have written and thinks it's deserving of her time. That took a, a huge shift in my own brain to to try to see people's enthusiasm as a compliment and not as like why why are they why? because that's the that's the tendency that my I, you know that my brain kind of goes so it, it was a wonderful thing and i think you just i i rode i rode it i rode that wave of just like well we're gonna do this and we got a beautiful cast and i now owe it to the cast 
to be as good as I possibly can and to show up prepared and to know what I'm doing and to pre-plan and, 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 and make it as good as it can possibly be. I owe that to everyone. It's that same kind of, when you work with a team, it's the same with, with uh, you know, Schitt's Creek. You're dealing with a team of like over 100 people. Yeah. Obviously, I want to make the show good, but I want to make the show good for, for all of them, you know, so that they didn't feel like their time was wasted. Um, and I think this, uh, it, was a, it was a wild process of making this movie, and I, I just, somehow, we came out the other end, um, and I feel proud of it, even though I think it was probably the most uh, cruel I've ever been to myself, that process. I'm so sorry to I'm so sorry to hear you struggle with that. I struggle with that too, and sometimes I feel like I'm the only person who does. I call it Dave. I always say I I, I read a book the other day that told me to a little while ago that told me to name myself critic. So sometimes oh. like if, if I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you and I go, oh that was a stupid question, or like what are you doing here, or like oh he's gonna he's gonna say what the hell do you mean by that, and I'm not gonna have an you know I go oh that's, that's Dave that's Dave telling me to do that. You but know don't you find it fascinating like. The, the honesty of, of owning how we feel is t discussed so rarely because I look at someone like you and I listen to you in your interviews and I think, well, this guy is, I don't think I'll ever be as cool as this guy. Oh, but yeah. He know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that is who you are to people. Yeah, yeah, I know. You are someone that is confident and calm yeah. and you don't have to perform. You know what I mean? Yeah. I sometimes feel like I have this desire to like, perform to be a version of myself that people might like yeah but i think you look at all these people everyone around us and we're all struggling with something it's just we don't end up having we don't have the freedom of, the, of having those conversations to comfort each other in those moments and feel like less awkward and alone it makes me feel a little bit less alone though you know that the, even when you get yeah. to that then i mean also like i've done the show for so long it never goes away. I haven't yet. I haven't yet met to meet anybody at any level who who that's gone away. You know, it just you just kind of get used to it. You get you get better at handling it. Yeah, it's funny. This this whole process was, I think, because it's the most vulnerable, uh, like thing I've ever done. I I feel I don't know why I was quite as hard on myself, and um, I've come out the other side of it, obviously, and I'm I can now appreciate. I can, I can now appreciate it, but. It's a it's a process, man. Like it is tough. It's it's tough if you are not someone who is like unbelievably confident, <laughs> because you're just looking for someone to validate your own fears about yourself. And the minute that someone even hints at it, you think, well, that's exactly it. Oh yeah, or that's what it's they true. meant. They definitely meant that. That I know what they yeah. meant by that, and it's that I'm bad exactly. at my job. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, did you? I mean, I I first was introduced to you. Um, Dan through MTV and like the Hills live after show. And then I, I got to know you through Schitt's Creek and we, and we have some mutual mm -hmm. friends who are involved in that. I didn't know, I didn't know you had, a, um, and of course I know your, your, your dad's work and stuff like that, but I didn't know um, filmmaking was something that you were aspiring to. I mean, were you, were you a yeah, young a film student? Yeah. Were you, yeah. You were a young person wanting to be a filmmaker. I dropped out of film school my last year of film school to take the job at MTV. And I tried desperately to like have my time at MTV act as credit so that I could actually get a degree. Um, and they said no. So I am a college dropout. But yeah, I was in film school for three and a half years. And um, you know, I think that's why this moment in particular feels very profound because t television and the success in TV was was not what I had originally intended to, <laughs> to do with my life. And to be perfectly honest, once I started making TV, I, I got really fearful about making films. The idea of writing a screenplay to me was freaking like terrifying. Um, why, I don't why, know why, 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 why? I don't know, because- You were writing thousands of hours of TV. I can't explain it to you. It's the like, it was the totality of telling a story over nine, in, in this case, like 97 minutes. I didn't know how to do it. I, I had become so comfortable telling a story in 21 pages, not a not hundred. So yeah, it was, I, I guess it, for a while I had kind of cast away the idea that I would ever make a film. And then somehow the idea for the screenplay came and I, 
again, like overrode my own fears to say, okay, let's try this. At the very least, let's try it. I bought Save the Cat. I bought all the screenwriting books. I started to read. I started to talk to my friends who had written screenplays before um, and ask them about it. Ask them about what was the scariest part for them. How, how do you do it? And, and like anything, there are ways that you can kind of get step-by-step -step guides. There are, you know, Save the Cat, funnily enough, was a huge tool for me. I needed like a I, rubric. I, I don't know I what needed... Save the Cat is. Oh, Save the Cat is like one of the great screenwriting books. And it walks you through in a very easy way. It walks you through the process of how to write a screenplay. It breaks down, it breaks down every element of what you need to do to come out of the experience with a screenplay. And so I was bookmarking, going through the pages, making notes, doing all of that, trying to figure out how it, how it works. Because writing TV is structurally very different than a film. If I, if, I, if I understand this correctly, after you win like 133 Emmys, yeah. You 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 win you win like a million. Yeah, I buy screenwriting for dummies, and, and you I go start reading. You, you buy the screenwriting Mad Libs and start filling it yeah. in. That's exactly it. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody. It's all a fluke. I mean, some people do, but a lot of my friends who are writers who have written like extraordinary works. I remember talking to to Phoebe Waller-Bridge about Fleabag and realizing that there are so many things that either happen on the day, so many moments that happened out of spontaneity, sp spontaneity and you think, well, this person, I mean, it, they, everyone is going through the same kind of experience and everyone has doubts about themselves and everyone has kind of fears about their own capabilities and fears that like, maybe this is it and I'll never find, you know, another idea. I think there's such a there's there's this amazing thing about acknowledging the fact that you don't know what you're doing, you know? And all you can do is try. And all you can do is put pen to paper and say, okay, today I'm gonna I'm gonna write a page or I'm gonna read this chapter of this book and figure out, okay, well, chapter one, what's the log line? And that is an exercise. You think, okay, I think I have this idea for the movie, but what is the log line? What is if I have to distill what I want to say in this movie to one sentence, what is it? All of these little fun exercises help. And I recommend that book to everybody. I think it, it helps tremendously. I mean, there's all these auteur writers sometimes that break the mold of, of what a screenplay yeah. should be. But yeah. like anything, I think more, more, more often than not, people love to be kind of guided through the process. Watch this for a segue. Speaking of being guided through the process, I um, uh -huh. when I was when I was doing research for this interview, you know, a lot of the things that you 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 get asked, you have gotten asked up to this point, were things about the, the when everything was kind of happening to you at Schitt's Creek. A lot of questions about like, you know, did your dad give you advice around building a career in show business? Mm -hmm. What is it like to be building a career in show business uh, as a young gay man in Canada? What is it like to build a career? Blah 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 blah. The 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 longer I do this gig. The, the thing I'm realizing is that I think the only thing that's harder than building a career in show business is the almost impossible task of sustaining a mm. built career in show business. Who do you look for for guidance on that? Is it is it your father? Is it people? Like, is that something you think about or is that just something I think about? I don't think about it at all. Good, Dan. And I don't say that like... I'm not lying because I know I'm, I had to think about it because I, you know, I, I think that I think you could lie about something like that. I value the integrity of the work that I do, and if that stops and I have to go back to the bakery that I worked at in Toronto like 25 years ago, so be it. I I value the integrity of the work more than anything else. And I think it scares people because I'm happy to walk away from a project if I feel like it won't honor that integrity. At the end of the day, it's all we have as, as people who create things. You go to bed at night, you put your head on your pillow, and you have to fall asleep knowing that you, you, you protected the integrity of, of your work and that you didn't give yourself away for the sake of someone else's agenda or success 
what is success if you've bent over backwards and compromised yourself for the sake of getting there? It's not worth it, to be perfectly honest. And, I, you know, I, again, this is like, this is a conversation that I think a lot of people don't believe. But I genuinely, much like a lot of my cast on, on Schitt's Creek, we did not intend to be famous. We followed a path that brought us excitement and joy and exhilaration. I love performing. I love performing for an audience. That, I've loved that since I was a kid. I, I wrote and produced and starred in all my school plays at North Toronto and when I was a teenager. I have loved the idea of bringing an idea to life and, and, and giving it to people. Fame is a completely different conversation. I accept it because I have to, because it's a part of the job. I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those people that, that kind of wants to excuse myself from it. I understand that it comes with the territory, but it is not something I sought out. And when you don't seek out fame, it has to be about the work. And that's all, that's all we have. So for me, it's not about sustaining a career. It's about preserving the integrity of the ideas and the work that I do. And if those hit, great. And if they don't, great. I just hope that I continue to get those opportunities to continue to tell stories. That's, that is my next thing. If that's sustainability, then, then sure. But my hope is that if the specificity of what I'm doing works, then I will get another opportunity to make something else. But it's not this overarching thing about like, I need to, you know, I remember when Schitt's Creek ended, I was hearing like momentum, momentum. Yeah, momentum. yeah. I, I mean, like, it was what? all the news. What's what are he we talking what's about? What's he? What's he gonna do next? Oh, I heard he signed this big deal. What's he gonna do? Oh wow, what's he gonna do next? You know? I know. I and, am. And and I I, I think Schitt's Creek taught us all that you should be questing after projects that that make you feel good, that make you feel like showing up to work is exciting, and if you're lucky, that the work that you do means something to someone else. And I will always try to make things that mean something because if they mean something to me, I have to hope that they mean something to someone else. Regardless of whether it's a comedy or a drama, a movie or a TV show, you know, you, you gotta kind of, you gotta kind of run with your, your passions and, and hope that they, hope that it amounts to something. But, but Dan, they, they meant, and they mean so much to, to so many people. I mean, to point in, in case, in July, you and your dad are appointed to the Order of Canada for co-creating Schitt's Creek. And for the, I'll read the quote here, trailblazing advocacy of two SLGBTQI plus communities. What went through your mind uh, when you heard that? I still don't believe it's real. I don't, <laughs> I, I, um, <laughs> I don't, um, I don't think you can, I mean, Again, it's like the more you think about something, the more you believe that you, that that some kind of accolade you, you, that you are what in a place to to earn it. There's so many people I think yeah, in this yeah, country yeah. that deserve it. Yeah, you know, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time to get it. And so I, I don't know. I think in the same way that with the Emmys, it's like yes, they're on a shelf, and sometimes I will stop and think, wow, this is fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so proud of the team and I'm so proud of my family and I'm so proud of Catherine and Annie and our crew. Like, you know, that is the greatest. Annie Murphy winning her Emmy meant more to me than all of my Emmys combined, to be honest. You know, finding someone who was an actor who showed so much promise in an audition room and then seven and a half years later watching that person win the highest award you can possibly receive on American television that is what we're here for. So I deeply appreciate the Order of Canada, but for me, it's you can't hang your hat on something like that. You can you can take take it, accept it, love it, and then you you got to move on because you can't. It, your ego will just lose its mind. But that, that that being said, the the fact that it was foretelling LGBTQ plus stories was was meaningful to me in particular. Of I mean, I, I don't know what kind of conversations you're having, but I felt like I feel like in the past year I've had more uh, creators come in from that community. I mean, I should point out that you're you're Canadian, you're living in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've, I've I've never had more creators from LGBTQ plus uh, communities. Tell me that in 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 some cases. I don't know if this is something you're seeing in the States. It's getting harder to tell some of these stories than it was before. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it's easier and I, th I think in some ways it stayed the same. I don't know if it's harder. I just think it was impossible before. Yeah. So we've made some progress for sure. I think what, I, what I've tried to do with the success that I've had in, in America is to use that success to take friends of mine who have really strong voices and want to tell stories and say, okay, hello, executive, now look at this person. I believe in this person, so you should believe in this person. That's what this, I think that, and, and maybe it's the Canadian in me, but I, I just don't feel comfortable accepting success without using it to lift up other people because that's what happened to me. And you can't just sit there and say, okay, me, 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 what's next? You have to say, what makes success fulfilling is the ability to use it to help other people to use it to open doors for other people, to use it, you know, I don't want, I don't want the responsibility of, of only, of being one of the few people to tell stories about, about gay people, about queer people. It's important for me to take friends of mine, you know, queer friends of mine and say, they're really funny. They have a great stand-up set. They have a great idea for a pilot. Hello, buy into them. They're worth it. Because I, I, I truly believe that, that great parts you know, for the most part, are written by people who have experienced them. I'm not getting a lot of, like, really nuanced gay <laughs> auditions. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of have to write them for myself. And all the really great parts that I have read have come from writers who have that experience themselves. So it's about providing opportunity for, for, for communities of people to get to tell their stories so that the actors have more to work with ultimately if that if any of that makes sense it all I mean, oh my god it, it all it all makes a, a, a perfect sense the idea i mean my favorite thing you said was that i i want to lift up people because that's what people did to me yeah yeah of course you know i i i am i am absolutely aware of the opportunity that was provided with, for me i know exactly what that conversation is i'm confronted by it all the time but what I won't, ex the idea of nepotism. Oh, I wasn't talking about that. I was just talking about people looking out for people. I was just talking. You oh, no, 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 no. And I, I, I agree. But I think from optically, from an outside perspective, I, you know, you, it's all you hear sometimes. Oh. Is, is, oh, this opportunity was given because of. We're talking about, you know, opportunities that are provided. I think from an outsider's perspective, a lot of that would be perceived as, as a nepotism conversation. And at the end of the day, like, and I know that there was this big conversation about that a little while back. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and that, like, it, 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 it's a magazine, right? It was a, uh, was it a New York <laughs> like, magazine or something like that. I don't know what it was. Yeah, I, I remember that. And I understand why people believe in it. And I understand that there are probably moments where it's true. But the industry has too much money on the line for people's kids to just be handed jobs. It's frankly like, it doesn't work like that. And if you happen to kind of wander into your parents' profession, it's because it's in the home. And I, I, I think for me, I got to witness the funniest people in the world, like coming and going from my house. Why would you not want to be a part of that? Mm. But at the same time, I feel like what my dad and I did together was equal parts, was a contribution from equal sides. Mm. And I know in my, in my heart that, that I did what I could and I held up my end of the bargain. And, and so for me, it was, you know, it's, it's about, using that to continue to help other people. Well, that, that's what I was getting to. I mean, I, yeah. I, just any, you know, the idea that we, we listen, I'm, I, I, people have helped me every step of the way in this thing. Like, you know, the, of course, the, it's, the, it's how we do, go through life. And I do see it as my responsibility when someone comes in on, on this show or I meet someone else at the CBC, either to warn them and get them out of here or to, 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 <laughs> to, say, to think, think about doing something else or to go uh -huh. or, or in all seriousness to, to try and do what other, about thousand people did for me and, and tried to do it for other folks it, yeah it's 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 peace of mind at the end of the day it's knowing that you did the right thing also at the end of the day this watching this film reminded me that you are above i mean in, in a great thinker about the industry and a great a great actor but what a writer what i mean what a what a, a, a gifted uh, writer you are and you do really see that in this in this film and um i i i read you say this thing um and I, it caught me off guard, and I didn't really know what you meant by it, so I wanted to ask you about it. Okay. I read you say that writing is one of the most meaningful outlets for questioning my feelings. 
Okay, let me break it down. Okay, I'm ready. I can understand how that could be confusing. I liked it. I know, don't get me wrong, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I well, sometimes you just say things that ultimately mean nothing. <laughs> Um, I no, I didn't think that. I didn't think that. <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes things just come out of your mouth and they don't make any sense. This is not one of those times, Dan. I got I, a feeling. I feel like I, I, I often find myself questioning myself. I find myself questioning life. I find myself debating a lot in my head. And writing is one of the rare ways where I can find clarity in the confusion. If, am I still speaking yep, in you got, circles? You got me, you got me. No, I'm with sparkles. you, I'm with you, I'm with you. And so with this movie, like, again, I was confused by the idea of grief. I was confused by my relationship to it. I was confused about whether I was doing it properly. And so in the process of writing this script, I was able to answer some of those questions and I was able to kind of focus my feelings, even though what I was writing wasn't directly related to my own grief. It was related to the bigger questions that I was grappling with. And I was able to kind of detangle and focus my thoughts so that by the time that I finished the movie, and there's a line that Celia Imrie says at the very end of the movie, um, where you know er, 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 we have kind of gotten through the storm, and and she she says to avoid sadness is to also avoid love. That was the answer to my question. That was the revelation that came th somehow through my brain onto the page, onto the laptop, into an actor's gorgeous performance and out into the world. So I didn't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sentiment that I, I, I didn't pre-plan. Pre I didn't have that line written down thinking like, oh, this is a good one. It wasn't in the note. It wasn't in the note. <laughs> it wasn't in the snowfall. It was something that happened because at that point in the storytelling, something unlocked and a clarity mm. about how I was feeling came to me and I wrote it down. Ah, beautiful. And so it is this wonderful, it's a torturous, wonderful, exhilarating experience of telling stories, for me, telling stories, but in the, in the process, trying to understand my own feelings. And it gets, it gets spread out amongst all these different characters. It gets spread out in little pieces and conversations and questions that are asked by different characters throughout the movie. And, and, and by the end of it, it worked, you know? So it, it brought me a, a tremendous amount of closure and, and peace in, in understanding what this was all for. Through, through, the, through the work itself. Um, Dan, I loved, I loved the film. Um, I loved Thank you getting, getting the chance to talk to you today. Uh, next time, third time's a charm for having you in the studio, I think. <laughs> I'm telling you, the next time I'm in Toronto, I'm coming by, whether you want me or not. Yeah, you're just so. gonna you're gonna bust in at a at an interview. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. Cardinal Officiel, you're just gonna bust in and you know like hey, I got yeah, this just stuff bust up. in. You're yeah. gonna hear like a very soft <laughs> knock and then me saying like, "Are you sure? Is this okay?" <laughs>